Hello there, and welcome to Success as a Student, a skills podcast for students and anyone who wants to develop key skills that will help them in being successful. My name is Alexander Wood. I create online skills content for the University of Derby. Outside of work, I'm a trustee, a chairperson of a youth group, and the University of Derby Graduate of the Year. In this series, we focus on how you can develop skills that will help you to succeed in your university study, your career, and in your personal development all by interviewing experienced University of Derby staff and successful students. In today's episode, we're exploring how you can develop the skill of presenting to an audience. I'm helped today by Russell Lewis, the head of the Student and Graduate Experience team, and we will discuss how we both prepare for presentations, the methods that we use for overcoming our nerves, advice for presenting without a script, and much, much more. This episode has genuinely helped me with presenting, so do watch all of it and hopefully you'll gain as much as I have. So hello Russell and thank you very much for giving your time today to be part of the Success as a Student podcast. Would you like to introduce yourself to anyone listening? Hi Alex and thank you for having me. Yeah, my name's Russ Lewis and my job title is Head of Student and Graduate Experience at the University. Uh, And I am a graduate of the University. I did history at Derby between 2008 and 2011. Yeah, so thank you very much for your time and as your job title might suggest as the head of student and graduate experience you do a lot of presentations and so we thought it would be ideal for you to come on and talk today about the skill of presentations and also how students can develop their confidence so I think the first and most important thing to discuss at the start is to set out what a presentation is so would you be able to explain to me what is meant by presentation at university and why the skill of presentations is important for students to develop from beyond their degree and the course that they're studying no problem at all. Um, great first question. Well, I think in its most general use, a presentation will normally be a type of assignment that you might be asked to do on one of your modules that you're undertaking, and it could form part of the overall assessment of the module you're taking, or it could be just one little part of it. Uh, however, I think a presentation is is much more than that. Um, it will be extremely rare that I think anyone manages to go through university and to the world of work without having to deliver at least one or two presentations. Um, you could actually be asked to do a presentation as part of the entry requirements to enrol into some university courses. As an academic assessment strategy, I do get the sense that it has become more common over the last probably five to eight years in assessing students' understanding of a topic. Um, I think if you can explain something to others, it shows that you've learned it as well. Um, You will more than likely have to do some form of presentation when you go for a job interview. Um, So this is where we kind of draw into the second part of your question about why it's important to be able to be prepared for doing a presentation. Um, So you could become to interview asked to be ready to deliver a presentation on a particular topic. Um, Or if you're not asked to do that, I often think the actual interview is a form for presentation as well. You're presenting yourself to a a future and a prospective employer. And you want to do that in the best possible light to give yourself the best chance of of landing the job. Um, So another form of presenting is delivering a speech. Um, students can be asked to deliver speeches at award ceremonies that the, the union might run uh, or the university hold. You could do a speech at a significant life event like a, a wedding uh, or potentially on more kind of somber occasions like, like funerals. And on each of those occasions, you're conveying a message to an audience. So that is your presentation style coming through there is what is it that you're trying to get across. Um, and I think then whatever type of work you go into, you'll be able to draw on the sorts of skills you can learn from presenting. If you're going into say, fashion, art, uh, business, engineering, a lot of different fields, there could be a product or a service that you're trying to sell to prospective clients. So you'll be talking to other people about something. And that essentially is what a presentation is. And so every type of discipline, I think, having the skill set and confidence to do a presentation will help you through your student journey and then the skills can help you get a job and then keep that job and progress 
So I think it's a, a kind of universal skill. So I think it's a really good topic that you do in this podcast episode, on, Alex. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, I think, as you said, it's such an important skill to develop for both your degree and getting the most out of it but also for beyond that. And I think if you're at university, this is the perfect time to develop those skills because you're doing so in a bubble where there isn't those real consequences for making mistakes with those presentations. Yes, I would completely agree because it gives you that little bit of a chance to experiment, see what type of things you are comfortable with with presenting because I'm sure you'll have heard and I'm sure people listening to this will have heard that public speaking is often cited as people's number one fear. And this is a great opportunity at university to try and remove that fear from whatever it is that's the reason that you have it, because you can end up doing it so often that it becomes almost second nature. And I think that's how I've got to become quite confident at doing presentations Um and it's just that ability to kind of keep keep going and keep trying different things that really helps develop those skills and cement them into your your repertoire. Yeah, practice is definitely a really good way to develop those presentation skills. But given that I mentioned that university is the perfect opportunity to develop their presentation skills, how do you think, Russ, that students can develop their presentation skills whilst at university, both either inside of it or outside of it? Um. I think possibly the best way is that last line we've just talked about is practice. I developed my pra- um, presentation skills pretty much through trial and error, for want of a better phrase. Um, I went into a sales role after school. I, I didn't go to university until I was a mature student. So I spent six years um, presenting to customers um, on how the latest product that we were trying to sell was the thing that they should have on their shelves ready for customers to buy, but also presenting to importers uh, and global companies that the company I was working for was the best chance of them getting good revenues from selling things in the UK. So that gave me a good foundation of how to present in different ways, trying to sell the service and then sell the product. Um, from those kind of formative years that would be for many students listening now in that age bracket, kind of I was 18 to 24 doing doing that. And that came a good opportunity to learn those, those skills. And when I, when I came to university, I worked for an agency called AIM Hire, which was a government agency where we'd go into local schools in Derby and Derbyshire and try and talk to young people about higher education and for them to be able to see it as part of their future when it might not have been necessarily something they considered from students that were from what are classed as um, widening participation areas. And this was a great opportunity as well to, to learn a new skill of being able to tailor my presentation style and content to the audience. So I could be presenting to students that were 11 but also presenting to students that are 18. And that is a big difference when when you're that age about the content of the presentation, the style, the way you come across. So that was another really good bit of practice to be able to to tailor the content and my style. And I think I was also really lucky in the undergraduate degree that I did, which which was history. And presentations were part of the assessment strategy. So every module had a presentation as part of it, and it would make up, uh, I think, between like, say, 15 and in some cases, 50 percent of the module mark was a presentation. Um, So I probably did 20, 25 presentations as part of my undergrad. Um, And again, that required different type of presentation skill when you're trying to convey an academic understanding of a topic uh, and be able to answer the questions that, that come back from your fellow classmates. Um, to the point where doing presentations now has become quite almost something I enjoy. <laughs> um, and then from from that, I've been able to then do quite a few speeches, um, which is another form of presenting. So I'm often the first person that someone will see at graduation um, on stage. So I do a little warm-up speech mm-hmm. um, to, to the audience and kind of get the crowd going a little bit, which I really enjoy doing. Um and that's kind of then in front of 4,000 people, but I, I really like it. And some people say to me, I don't know how you do it. That looks terrifying. It's like, wow, it's brilliant. Um, and it, it quite, that. do you? Yeah, my mind. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, I'm glad. Um, so I think then practicing presenting in these different types of ways is is the best opportunity and the best way I think for students to develop those skills because you'll learn what works, what doesn't work, what is getting the reaction you're wanting. For all those different scenarios, you'll be able to be the best judge of your presentation. I think people are their own best judges themselves when they look at the audience in front of them when they're doing a presentation. How are they responding? How are they reacting? Are they understanding what I'm saying? Are they engaging with me? Do they look interested? Um, so by trying different things and practicing, you'll learn what works best for you, I think. Definitely. I think uh, that's probably the top tip there for how you can develop the skills is just get out there, take the opportunities you can to present, whatever they may be, and then try to learn from them, reflect on them and actually incorporate what you've learned into the next one and so on. And yeah, just having just going out there and trying it in lots of different ways, trial and error, as you said earlier. Uh, I think, yeah, really good piece of advice there. Uh, it links to some of the other skills that we mentioned already on the podcast, such as reflection and also critical thinking in terms of actually thinking about asking those questions to see whether you got what you wanted or whether the audience reacted. One thing that you did mention there was about how you can tailor the presentation to the different audience that you have. And you mentioned different times that you did presentations and how each of them was a little bit different in terms of the audience or the size of the audience or who was in there, the different background of that. So we mentioned earlier how a law presentation might be a bit more serious, uh, whereas a, a presentation to all the students graduating may be a bit more maybe a bit more exciting and there might be a bit different tones to have there. So do you have any advice for how you can decide what the audience is beforehand and tailor the presentation that you make? I think to be able to tailor a presentation effectively to the audience, you do need to know who the audience is. Mm. Now, for most people doing their undergraduate degree, that will either be the same students in their year, or it could be the year below potentially, or students in one of the cohorts. So it's it's fairly standard there'll be other students. Um, there are a couple of courses that I do know of that will have members of the public come in. Um, so you will have then possibly some people outside of the higher education bubble where you might need to just explain a bit more terminology, maybe a bit more sim simply. So in a general sense in, in university, knowing the audience is fairly standard. It's going to be other students or um, members of the public and definitely your academics. But then when you go into the world of work or you're doing presentations as part of something that isn't getting you an actual, actual academic mark, there's nothing wrong with asking the people that are organising it for an insight into the people that are going to be the audience. What's their makeup? Where are they from? What 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 is it that they're looking to get out of it as well? And then once you know that, that gives you the most important piece of intelligence to know what it is that you're going to tailor the topic on. So, for example, we talked about age earlier. You would definitely tailor a presentation differently to a younger audience than you would do, say, to a university audience or to group of professionals because they wouldn't understand it in some cases. They wouldn't be following it. They wouldn't engage. And that then is not what you want at all from a presentation. So knowing the audience is the most important aspect in being able to tailor a presentation. And then just having that in your mind, what is it that the audience needs to get out of listening to my five minutes or my 30 minutes? What is it that they need to come away from that I need to convey? And then age is quite an easy one to, to tailor, but then if it's um, something where you might be selling an idea or a concept, I uh, always think about the Dragon's Den scenarios. You see some fantastic presentations on there. They know who's going to be in front of them. So they mm. occasionally will pitch a presentation to spark the interest of a particular dragon, maybe. Um, and that, that's always helpful then to, to know who it is you're trying to get the response from. So you've got two pieces of advice there. You mentioned, first of all, uh, in terms of preparing for the presentation, you've got tailor it to the audience. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid of asking them this which could be a confidence, a question that takes a lot of confidence, which is, who am I presenting to? But yep. then the second thing you just mentioned there was about knowing the aims of your presentation. And I think that's a really, really important thing to do beforehand. What do you want to get out of the presentation? 
what are the people who've asked you to do the presentation want to get out of it and what will the audience want to get out of it as well and the audience may be the same person as the person who's actually asked you to do it in a presentation assessment that's probably going to be the case because it's probably going to be your module tutor who's both the audience and the person asking you but if it's a presentation to the public that might be slightly different so definitely important to consider what your aims are going into it but those are just two things that you can do to prepare for a presentation. Do you have any other advice for how students can prepare for presentations, Russell? Yes, and I think this comes down to probably the most important part of any successful presentation is the preparation. Um, because it will help solve all the other issues and worries that people have about delivering a presentation. Nerves, self-confidence, all of that can very quickly be diminished if you've prepared well. I'm sure you'll have seen, and um, people listening to this will have seen presentations or speeches where you can just tell that the presenter or presenters weren't prepared. Mm. And there's nothing worse than that. If everyone involved, if the presenter or the presenters, the audience, the marker, if someone isn't prepared, then everything is going to not flow in the way you want it to. Um, so preparation means that you get that key ingredient for a successful presentation, and that's control. So if you're prepared, you've got control. You're in control of the content. You're in control of the slide order if you've got a PowerPoint. You're in control of the timing. And that is what preparation gets you to, is control. So for, for myself, if it's a new presentation, the way I try and do this is give myself a, a deadline of when I want everything done, like the content ready for. Mm. And I'll try and do that around about a week before the presentation is about to be prepared and delivered. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'll run through it fully a week before and just see where I need to adjust. Is there any bits of content that aren't quite right? And I'll speak it out fully. I'll then leave it two or three days just to let my mind play with it kind of subconsciously so that um, understanding what I'm trying to convey and I'll do it then around four days before the presentation again and practice and just fine-tune it and then finally if I can I'll either do it the night before or the day of so the morning of and I find that then I'm prepared in my head for the flow of things and then I'm able to get that control that I'm looking for I know the timings, I know the sequence of everything, I've practiced it, so I feel in complete control. And that then is my best way of developing myself and preparing myself to present, is gaining the control of everything that's in part of the presentation. That's why I think students should really embrace a presentation, because you, if you prepare well, you are in complete control of that assessment because you're delivering it, you're running the timings of it, you're looking at what's on the content of the slides, you're in complete control. It's almost the best way of giving yourself a chance of getting those marks that you're looking for. So yeah, I think those are some really good pieces of advice for how you prepare. Uh, I think there's a few things to unpack there. Uh, and the first one of those is that you practice it a few times, you leave it a few days to change it so you're not getting too scripted, that you can develop it and reflect on it with potentially fresh eyes, which is what I always say. Um, you practice, make sure you know the timings and you prepare the timings and then you adjust them. Um, I've got a question for you about that though. Do you, when you make the timings, do you plan timings loosely beforehand and try to write to those timings and then adjust them afterwards? Or do you just go with the timings that you think are best and then make the presentation to those timings in the editing of that presentation i try if it's something say um if i'm presenting as part of a conference sometimes conference timings can go a little awry if something's gone wrong in the morning there might be a tech issue so i'm prepared in my timings to be able to adjust them on the fly so yeah. do i need to add in some more time do i need to cut some time out that that kind of comes with practice so definitely that that's probably a little bit later down the line but um in terms of being able to control the timings i'll know the time slot i've been given so if i've been given say 20 minutes to present on a topic 
I'll then try and look at the slot of the day I'm in. Am I in the horrible slots before lunch when people are just thinking about what they're going to eat or the slot after lunch when people are still full? Ideally, you want that kind of mid-morning, mid-afternoon slot if you can help it. And you've got the best chance of the audience being at their, their peak. And then I'll know I've got 20 minutes to convey this point. Where is the point that I need the audience to know? Which is the killer point that I need? And I'll try and get that around about 60% of the way through. So here's the, the golden nugget. I've done the introduction, done the setting the scenes. Here's my point. And I can wrap it around the ending, ready for, say, five minutes of questions. But I've hit that killer point, if there is just one, around about 60% of the way through is the is my best attempt at trying to get that in. I think that's some really good advice there. Um, just thinking about it. Yeah, you do have to adapt to the timings you're given and the, the time slots. And often you could end up being, late, being later You could when you're starting. And a presentation in class, that's often fine because you still get the same amount of time. But they may rush you slightly or may make you reduce that. And it is a skill to adapt. I remember I have, an, I have a 45-minute referencing talk and I had to do it once because of delays in 15 minutes. And you'd have to learn to adapt on the fly uh, to that sort of thing. I can't say it's the best presentation ever, but you have to be able to adapt, to, probably not to that extreme, but I'm sure you've got loads of examples of having to do similar things. But yeah, thinking about that killer time and thinking about in advance, when do I want to be delivering the key message? I think that's really good, a really good tip that I've not thought of uh, myself, and I'm definitely going to take that on board. Um, and I want to move on to the next stage of presentation. So we haven't presented yet, but we're just before the presentation, probably the day, the day before the presentation. Yep. And you might be feeling slightly nervous, which often students will do. So I'm just wondering, do you have any advice for students who are nervous just before a presentation? And then afterwards, I'll ask you about uh, what if you get nervous during your presentation? OK, uh, well, I think this is a really good question to ask, Alex, because even the most confident of presenters will have a little bit of nerves and you can get to the point where it's more excitement than nerves, but there'll still be a little bit of nerves there. And the best piece of advice I ever got taught for dealing with nerves is possibly the most simplest piece of advice as well. And it's just to breathe. And there is a breathing technique that you can look up, you can look online about it, and it's uh, just called 7-Eleven Breathing. So it's called 7-Eleven breathing. And basically all it is, is you breathe in through your nose for seven seconds and out through your mouth for 11 seconds. And if you can't do that ratio, that's okay. You can do say five seconds in through your nose and eight seconds out through your mouth, as long as the exhale through your mouth is longer than the inhale. And there is a whole load of science behind this. And I'm not even going to pretend to explain it in philosophical detail but essentially what it is it's a way to tricking your brain into thinking it's going to sleep and um, what it does then if your brain thinks it's going to sleep it turns off the fight or flight mechanism which is what a lot of people have when they're going into a situation that makes them nervous so it could be for a presentation uh, but you could also use this for an exam mm a job interview, anything where you're fully nervous, the best way to control those nerves is to get back control of your brain and turn off that fight or flight mechanism. And the way to do that is to breathe. And this 7-Eleven technique is just phenomenal. I do it to this day. If I'm going into a presentation or a situation that I'm a bit nervous about, I will just give myself maybe two or three minutes if I can get that long to sit somewhere by myself, close my eyes and just concentrate on nothing but that 7-Eleven breathing. Mm. And when you then go in to deliver the presentation or do the exam, do the job interview, whatever it is you're about to go into, your mind then is fully on and you've got over the fight or flight technique um, and that, that response that your brain can generate when you're nervous. And it is hardwired into us from our ancestors of when people wouldn't have necessarily the time to think things through, they just need to get out of dodge and get away from a situation that could be really critical to their lives. It's just never been able to fully be switched off in our in our brains as we've evolved. 
So the way to do it is to to breathe. Seven Eleven breathing. I 100% swear by it, and it's got me through loads of different situations that I've been nervous about. And even if nothing else you use it for, if you can't sleep, it'll help you sleep. If you're trying to drift off to sleep one night and can't get there, this will help you sleep as well. I have to give it a go myself. I'll link I'll link it in the description of the YouTube version of this podcast uh, to a website where you can find uh, details about it. Um, but yeah, the way that I try to get around my nerves is slightly similar, but I don't okay. use that technique. I've never uh, tried it before, but I'm definitely going to try it before my next presentations. Um, I um, just try to distract myself and not focus on the presentation. So I just listen to music. I'll just do something that isn't the presentation for an hour to just have fun. Um, and then, because if I'm sitting there like worried about the presentation, often when I come to do the presentation, I will either be too be more nervous or I'll have learned it to to a level of scripting. Whereas I try to not script. I try to keep it free form. And so leaving it a few hours between when I've practiced it last and then doing it allows me to be a bit more free form. So I've just said that I don't script. Do you? Do you script in presentations or do you have any advice about when students should or should not script? On a presentation, I don't hmm. script. On a speech, it's hard not to. Yeah. Um, so for a presentation, I, I think it's better to do what you said and be that bit more free, have that bit more freedom with what you're conveying. It makes you a more natural presenter. And I think in situations after university as well, when you're trying to then maybe do a presentation as part of your job, might be a selling of a product or a service. I think it makes you more authentic if you don't have a script because it shows you've got the confidence in yourself and it also shows that you've got the confidence in what it is you're talking about. Mm. Where you might have seen people over the years studying a presentation and, and holding a piece of paper, often kind of shaking the papers rattling as well and it, I think it just doesn't convey professionalism in some areas so I I don't script that is the purpose I think in some cases for slides mm. so I always think and feel that the slides are the background to the presentation I'm the presentation I'm giving the content that's my background that isn't the presentation that's your aid memoir. It's the audience's way to kind of keep on check of what you're doing. So I'll make my slides a mixture of visuals and a few bullet points, but never sentences. Hmm. Unless it's maybe a key quote or something. In fact, any purposes that's referenced. Um, that way then I can look at the bullet points that's on the screen. I can look at the image and I'll know the sorts of things that I want to convey on that particular slide from what the content is of, of, is on the slide and that means I don't have to be scripted mm -hmm. for a speech I've done speeches where I have been scripted and I've been given a script to deliver uh, I had a situation where I was asked to do a presentation the first one of the graduation ceremonies I got given five minutes notice before being asked to go on stage and do that so I had five minutes to read the script and had to edit it slightly um, to be able to be comfortable delivering it. But I had a stock script where I had to run through it. So there wasn't much time to, to prepare. So I had to go out and deliver it to the best of my ability with very little notice. Other speeches where you're asked to just give a five minute quick address on X point, And again, you might have not much notice. You can do that speech without a script as well, because then it's more natural. So probably for both, I would prefer to be on the side of no script. Mm. Sometimes a speech will need a script, but it will very much depend on the setting you're in. Well, just to remind anyone who's uh, no script does not mean that you don't know what you're saying. It just means you're not following exactly what's been written down. You're sort of free forming it slightly. And you said already you've practiced it by this point three three times, maybe more. And so you have already practiced doing it. You know what the general points you're going to say are, but it doesn't always matter too much which order you do them or even if you do all of them. Um and so I always try to make sure I know what the bullet points I'm saying at the very minute, at the very least. But it doesn't necessarily matter exactly how I expand upon them. 
that's what I try to do um, with my own presentations, although I'm not an experienced speaker as you, uh, Russell. I think one of the reasons why it's important not to script is because uh, if you ask any questions within that presentation, uh, especially for me, um, we would get interrupted with, with presentations on the degree that I studied. Mm. Uh, and that's because it was a legal thing and the judge would want to know there and then what the questions were. So we didn't have the same control as other people might do. So I was prepared to, to be flexible and reorder my points around what questions I was asked. Um, so speaking of questions and answering questions, yeah. do you have any advice for students in preparing and also answering the questions that they're given in a presentation scenario? Sure. Um, well, firstly, try and see questions as a really, really good thing. For me, they're a good thing for, for two reasons, because straight away, I know that the audience have listened to me, they've understood what I was saying, and they were interested in it. And that's always a good thing for a presenter to know. And I think secondly, if I'm asked a question, I also know that I've created a comfortable space where people are happy to ask me something. Some presenters can create quite an uncomfortable environment for their audience, and being asked questions is a great indicator that you've created an environment where people feel comfortable and able to, to ask you something. So I think they're a really good thing, first of all, to, to remember that if you're asked a question, it's a really good thing. So how to kind of deal with them? Um, what I try and do is, is look at the person clearly that's asking me the question, if it's in a normal size room or lecture theatre, if you can do. If you're in a big presentation hall, maybe it might be a bit more difficult, but you can at least look at the sound the questions coming from um so i know of myself that i sometimes need just two or three seconds to form an answer in my head so what i do then is i try and again go back to that thing we talked about earlier gaining control i try and gain control of the time and generate those two or three seconds that i need so so what i'll do is i'll um, once the person ask, answering the question is finished, I'll thank them for it and then I'll ask them their name, where they're from, what they do, that kind of sort of thing. And when they're answering that, I've been given two or three seconds just to form the answer to the question that they've asked me. And it, it maintains that control that I have. Then. So then when I'm ready, then I'll give the answer and I'll use the person's name back in my reply. So it's quite a personalised reply then back to the person. Mm. Um, and I'll try and, and break up the answer if it's quite lengthy. And then finally, I'll just check in with the person that's asked the question if they're happy with what I've said. Do, does that give them enough information that they're looking for? Is that sufficient? Now, probably academically, um, and I have tried this myself on a couple of occasions and seen others do it. And it is a bit more risky. So if you feel confident in doing it, you can do. Is what I've done sometimes is held back content from the presentation that I've researched and learned about knowing that I'll be asked it by a marker. Hmm. So I might hold back something quite fundamental to the topic I'm presenting about, not included in the presentation, knowing or almost hoping that the marker will ask me about this to then be able to show that you can deliver a really good answer academically to a question. So it could be a key topic that you know there's no way that you're going to get through this session without being asked X if you don't include it. Um, so it's a bit more risky and depends how confident you are but i have seen it done really well and i've done it myself a couple of times and it's it's worked out well just hold back a couple of key nuggets of information from the presentation so that then you're asked a question you know you're going to be asked about it you can then deliver a great answer to that question because you know the content yeah i think both methods are valid i've never tried, heard it or tried the second method before but um yeah, it can be slightly, it could be slightly risky, uh, but the key word there is hoping, but it can potentially work. Um, so yeah, potentially try that out. Like we said earlier, universities are great choice to try these techniques and see if they work and see if they're for you. Um, but just going on to the first point, uh, you said about making time for yourself and giving yourself that control. Yeah. Uh, in an academic presentation, you probably, if it's 
especially if the only person in the room with you is a lecturer, which could be the case at the moment with these online presentations that we have at the moment. Um, if it is just a lecturer in the room, then asking mm-hmm. them to introduce yourself may not be the best way of gaining time, but because you might already know them. But there are other ways of creating time, and that's something that I always try to do. So um, my mentor gave me a really good technique for interviews, which is if you ask a tricky question and you realise when you're hearing it that you might need some more time, take a sip of your drink, and then uh, then you get bought some time whilst you're uh, dr- taking your drink. To The second way I try to buy time is by... Um, is by reframing the question into my answer. That's another few seconds brought. Um, And yeah, there are different techniques that you can do to buy yourself that time to think about your answer. You could potentially also ask for the question to be rephrased if it's really stumped you. Um, What I would say is don't do this on every single question, otherwise it might get slightly annoying uh, trying all these techniques. But yeah, there's definitely lots of different ways of buying yourself some time. I would agree with all of those. I think they're all really good tips as well. And then probably the only other one we haven't spoken about is pausing. So I don't think either there's anything wrong with being asked a question and pausing for a couple of seconds. And you can look all thoughtful as you do. Um, But that also allows you to get in those couple of seconds just to create the answer. And it shows, again, that you're in control and confident to be able to not say anything. There's another level of confidence there in being silent. Definitely. I, I actually, I went into a competition that was about presentations when I was in my first year, and I was against a third-year student from um, a different university, and he he ended up actually winning, or I think he either won or got to the final of the competition. He did really well in it. And there was the, we, drew, we drew on points. The tiebreaker was decided by his answer to the question versus my answer to the question. Oh. Which is, it hurt because I travelled a long way to go to the competition and stayed up all night doing the reading for it. But the way he answered the question, it, when I actually heard him answer the question, I thought, this is in the bag for me, I've won. What he <laughs> did is he stopped. For, for me, in the moment, it felt like he stopped for 60 seconds, maybe more. And I was like, what is he doing? This is what are you doing? Why why are you stopping? And I remembered that I'd answered my question instantly. Like they asked me the question, bang, straight at them with a reply. And it was I was really happy because I'd answered straight away. He done waited for an eternity, of course I've won. And what the judge in this case, which who actually was a judge, pointed out, uh by judge, I mean a court judge, he pointed out that my reply I didn't follow all the different formalities that you meant to apply in a, in a law answer to a question, and it wasn't very well structured. Whereas his reply, after waiting about a year, was well structured, <laughs> well thought, and really worked. And that was what won him the case overall. And that is that stuck with me. So if you are sitting there thinking about the answer, there's no issue of sitting there taking your time and pausing. Not at all. Uh, that that's a great way of illustrating that point, isn't it? Um, yeah, it certainly allows you to, if you know the answer, yes, then spend that time formulating the the way you're going to structure that answer back. Um, so that's another good way of, of doing it as well. So the only other question about uh, presentations that I have to ask you then is mm. about, do you have any tips and advice for speaking during a presentation? Yes, I think... When you're speaking during a presentation, the most important factor is to be able to be understood. So if you know you're a fast speaker, you need to work on slowing down your communication. If you have got a really sharp accent, perhaps, it's then about trying to soften it. I'm from Birmingham, so there are certain words that just Brummies can't say. I'm from and... Stoke, so. <laughs> um, Staffordshire, not Stoke, but I have a Stoke accent. So I do know sometimes I need to just make sure I'm getting those words out correctly in, in case the Brummie comes through too much. And the other two things that I do like to do in terms of a presentation with my speaking is if it's a real key point... I like to repeat it and it could just be a couple of words or a a couple of words in a sentence. I'll repeat it. And that makes the audience know or the people listening to you know, this is the key point. It's been repeated within a sentence. Hmm. And that is a great little way of making sure that if there's one 
absolute piece of information you need to convey in your presentation repeating it will often be the way of, of doing it but also then pausing after it so it could be you don't want to repeat it you want to say it once so i'd then try and pause after it as well uh, if i don't want to repeat that section and then again that lets the audience know this is the key thing for the, them to take home from that presentation so those those two things definitely help during it that works really well because you're the one in control and if yes. you pause no one's going to jump in you just you can sit there and let it bide its time and whatnot absolutely and it, again it goes back to the thing we've had running throughout this is that control you're in control enough to be able to give back a couple of seconds almost i don't need these couple of seconds because my content is so spot on i can afford hmm to pause on this point because I know this is what you need to know and I'm going to pause here. And the combination of those two things isn't always the best. I don't do them in the same presentation. I won't repeat and pause, but I might use one. Uh, if it's like, say, a presentation where I'm trying to get someone to understand a topic or put a message across, I might use one of them. And if it's a regular audience I'm presenting to, I won't do it all the time. But I will then have those in my armory almost of, of things to, to be able to use. And I think then the final bit is just to try and enjoy it. I think if you can enjoy what it is you're talking about and you've done all that preparation work, this is almost your chance to shine. This is the way to put the limelight on you. You've done all the work. Own that, own it and and really kind of take that time to to sell the thing you're trying to get across the audience you've done the hard work this is almost the easy bit because you're prepared you're confident you know what you're doing you've done your breathing you're in front of the audience they're all there listening for you have fun with it and enjoy it so some of my favorite presentations are ones where i'll get a laugh from the audience from a particular point and try and try and um, get a couple of jokes in or make light of a situation and again that makes you a very likable presenter then and it gives you a good chance of having the effect you're looking for. Definitely. that Your own emotions reflect onto the audience. If you're standing very rigidly with or nervously with a piece of paper in front of you, your arm shaking, that will reflect back to your audience. Whereas if you're standing there enjoying it, taking your time, not rushing to every word you're saying, but using different techniques to slow bits down where necessary or speed bits up, um, if that's something that you want to do, that can reflect back to your audience that enjoyment and people can hear that and people can see your body language and it, it i think it's really important things to do completely agree with you body language certainly helps bring home presentation as well if you feel confident enough to use your hands and talk with your hands i'm terrible i can't seem to do any speech or presentation without using my hands to <laughs> convey something i don't know what it is i just feel like i'd be completely almost have for want of a better phrase have my hands tied behind my back if i couldn't use them during a presentation <laughs> yeah mine are all over the place as well are they um which is interesting because when you do sit down presentations i don't know if they are as much but uh, definitely when i'm uh, stood up doing presentations your hands feel like we need to have somewhere to be so they're all over the place yeah. um but then again it's about learning what different things you struggle with and trying to adapt to them so i know my personal struggle was i speak far too quickly and that's okay. a lot of the time because i have so much content and i've tried to squish it in but that doesn't give me the ability to to make those big points sure to emphasize them in through either making them more bold or slowing them down for example or repeat them i think then if that's really good and i think knowing yourself and what it is that you will potentially need to just sharpen up on is is really good so if you're if you know you're going to speak too fast maybe on a presentation and you might have then done loads of work like i can imagine you're the sort of student that would have done loads and loads of work before something alex less work for presentations than you might think because <laughs> <laughs> i don't want to make them too, um, too 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 um rigid yeah maybe just then instead of conveying three points two so you then give yourself the time to convey two points really well and hold that third one back for the question. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's, 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 that's what I was thinking when you are saying it. I was like, oh, yeah. this could be a way to cut content and still sneak it in using that bonus question time. There you go. See, this could work for you as well. 
It could do, yeah. Uh, if I'm willing to to risk it, hope. But if they haven't <laughs> asked it, maybe I could answer a question and try to find a way to link it in if needed. Yes. Um. So I really appreciate all the advice you've given the presentation so far. Um. And I'm sure the students listening will get lots out of it, just like I have. Um. So thank you very much for those. But I have one last question I want to ask you, and that's a question which I ask to every single guest who comes on this podcast, which is, what advice do you have for a student who wants to be successful? That's a great question. I think where I'd start my answer to that question is whatever success means for you, it doesn't matter then what anyone else views that as. So if success for you is being able to attend every lecture in the module and being able to put a piece of work in for every assessment and you come out with a third class honours degree but you have absolutely worked your backside off for it and got that there's nothing wrong with that level of success because you've done everything that you can to achieve that knowing what success looks like to you is the best way of being successful Mm -hmm. and you'll then become the only judge of whether you've been successful or not not other people not what other people say, because everyone will have an opinion if you ask them that. Like, I'm sure you've already got different answers to this question. Lots. But for me, my best way of being successful is knowing what success looks like for me. And that will change on every different day. So if I've got a really tough meeting and I feel that at the end of it, I've come through that, well, I could have a disastrous another seven hours of the day. But that one meeting, that success for my day, it doesn't matter what happened in the other seven hours, that, that was the hard bit of the day and I've, I've achieved it. So recognising what success looks like to you is the best way to be successful because then you can make sure you're hitting the bits that matter. It doesn't matter what outcome you get, doesn't matter what grade you get. Some of the most successful people I know don't have a GCSE to their name and they've gone on to do fantastic things um equally there's people that have achieved fantastically well the professors in their discipline and have achieved some fantastic aims and outcomes but they will know what success looks like for them and until you can answer that question it doesn't matter anything else doesn't matter mm-hmm. but if you know what success looks like you're halfway there that's some amazing advice Russell uh, thank you so much for that um, I really appreciate that advice and yeah that applies to everything no matter if it's just a presentation success for you in a presentation maybe just going out there and actually speaking it may be going out there and doing the, the most amazing presentation in the world whatever that means to you is important so yeah and same for everything else every other skill every other thing you do there's different levels of success and don't compare yourself to others exactly so Thank you so much, Russ, for coming onto this podcast, giving your time and being interviewed today. You're more than welcome. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you, Alex, and good luck to everybody out there. So I'm recording this outro a week to the date of the interview with Russell. And already, in just this time, using the advice that Russell's given, I've already noticed that I've improved how I present. So hopefully, you find this advice as useful as I have. In the past week, I've presented three times to different audiences, including one presentation that made me particularly nervous. In all of these presentations, I tried using the 7-11 breathing technique that Russell recommended, and if I'm honest, it really worked. I was genuinely surprised by how my nerves just went away, and how I was able just to go into the presentation with my heart rate down, and in a position where I'm already comfortable, rather than having to make myself comfortable. So, as my first key takeaway point for this episode, I would recommend that if and when you're presenting, you try using the 7-11 breathing technique. My second key takeaway point is that when presenting, try to avoid using a script. This will help you with your body language, your voice, how you speak, and also with coping with nerves. Not using a script does not mean that you haven't thought about what you're going to say, but instead it leaves the details to be more freeform and adaptable. Russell said that when he presents, he doesn't use a script. But what he does do though, is that he practices his presentations a number of times in the week before to get his timings right and so that he has the opportunity to reflect on the quality and the delivery of the presentation. So a third takeaway point 
is to make time to practice your presentation before delivering it. In next week's episode, we're going to talk to Fran McKay about how you can self-motivate yourself for your degree and extracurricular study, and also for your career, and how you can persevere throughout your studies. This interview is very honest, and I found it really insightful, so do check that episode out once it releases. This episode was brought to you by the University of Derby Skills team. Production, episode planning, and editing was completed by Alexander Wood. Thanks to Stephen Plant for creating the amazing graphics and for balancing the audio of this episode. Thanks also go to Natalia Kodalavar, Tim Zalstra, and Naomi Bowers Joseph for giving feedback for this episode and the series on the whole. Thank you very much for listening.